regards to the event. Thanks for having protests to uh, get in here as well. Um, it is just worth mentioning that we're not expecting any kind of disruption tonight because of the event, uh, because of the protest. Uh, we'll have the security today, but in previous times there have been protests, there have been people who come and make that noise and that kind of thing. So if that's something that you struggle with, um, tonight we're not expecting uh, anything along those lines. Um, we, it's also worth saying we have extended multiple offers to have them in the room to engage with Charlotte to speak, uh, to talk, but they decided that they don't want to do that. Um, if you are interested in hearing uh, about their views on things, you can talk to them afterwards or you can go to some of their other events, but tonight this is about Charlotte. Um, so Charlotte was raised in the US and in Israel, uh, living in Jerusalem during the Second Intifada, which was a Palestinian revolt against Israel uh, in 2000. She worked with the international non-profit organization Stand With Us as the director of the International Student Program, I believe. Um, and she gives talks to students worldwide uh, and games on social media, which she sees crucial to defend the Israel public image. Uh, in 2001, Stand With Us was founded by uh, Rod Rothstein uh, and has worked with Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to change the state of public relations since the second intifada. Um, we recognize that Stand With Us Sorry, uh, uh, received much support, but also much criticism, notably from the Palestinian community. And this invest event is really intended as a platform to ask Charlotte questions regarding Israel's government, policies, history, and identity, to create a dialogue in what is a really contentious uh, area of discussion. Um, Charlotte will give a short talk, uh, followed by a discussion. The questions will be submitted via uh, Slido, with the Slido.com, uh, with the hashtag uh, 182, uh, sorry, 189233, on the board over there, so we'll submit questions towards the end. Um, mm -hmm. and submit questions then um, on uh, our speakers if there's any time to read them out, uh, or if you want to remain anonymous, I'll keep the point for um, But um, I believe this is the last talk that she's given on her from the UK, is that correct? Um, so if you look, and university. And university, yeah. So if you all give her a warm welcome, I'll hand over to Charlotte. Thank you very much. Now I say 
state of land of Israel, not the state of Israel, because my family didn't move into what would be known today as the proper state of Israel. My family moved into a territory that was under that is still under Israeli control, partial Israeli control. My family moved into the territory of the West Bank, uh, what is known in Israel, usually amongst Jews as Judea and Samaria. So like I said, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, some Israelis might call that Israel. I don't, again, that's an opinion, um, but it's not really in fact. The fact is, is that Israel is not technically part of the state of Israel. So I moved into what would be known as a disputed territory, the territory of the West Bank. Um, I lived in what's more commonly known as a Jewish settlement. Um, some would just call it a Jewish community um, over the Green Line, which is the line that separates the West Bank from the proper state of Israel, the sovereign state of Israel. I lived there for a year in a very small town, and then my parents realized that small towns were not for us, so we moved to the biggest city that we have in Israel, which is the city of Jerusalem with over a million inhabitants, a very diverse city, a city made up of about 37% Arab, about 63% Jewish, um, and within that, a tremendous amount of diversity as well within the Jewish population as well as within the Arab population. Lived there for four years. Um, two years into moving to Jerusalem, um, my life changed pretty dramatically. Um, when I turned 13 in the year 2000, about a month later, a huge wave of terrorism began in Israel, known as the Second Intifada. The Second Intifada, like we said, was a, 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 a popular uprising, is usually how it was described, but it was a wave of terrorism against Israeli citizens, uh, both Jewish and Arab, by the way. We were all targets of the Second Intifada. Um, so I lived in a city that was hit with over 600 terrorist attacks. That was Jerusalem. Uh, buses were blowing up. Uh, restaurants were blowing up. The marketplace that we shop at, Machane Yehuda, the Shuk, was blown up about 15 times by suicide bombers. Uh, I lived, unfortunately, in an environment where people around me were dying and people were losing family members and friends. Uh, I was one of those people. Uh, when I turned, when I was 14, a suicide bomber walked up to a group of my friends who were out eating pizza on a Saturday night, stood in the middle of them and blew himself up, and he murdered three of my friends um, that night and injured about 30 others. Um, let me just make very clear, there was not one adult standing in that crowd. Everyone, every one of the people injured in that attack were teenagers. Um, and there were no soldiers. This was a terrorist attack, as it should be called, because when you target innocent civilians for political or religious gains, that is a terror attack. And when you're, again, your intended target is innocent people. So for me, I lived through uh, a conflict I lived through terrorism. I had a lived experience that really shaped a lot of what I believed at that time and how I felt at that time. And then my family, unfortunately, after I missed the suicide bombing by 10 minutes myself, um, my family had decided at that point to leave Israel, not because I had missed the suicide bombing. I actually missed it. It was on my bus to school that I took every day. The suicide bomber got off my bus. I had taken an earlier bus and blew himself up and murdered 17 people for my community. And um, at that point, my family had already decided to leave. I just want to stress that there's this interesting feature in Israel that when things like that happen, the resilience really kicks in. And while that happened one day, the next day, I got on the exact same bus and I went to school, just like I had done every day before, because that's how we stand up to terror in the most powerful way possible, is to just keep living our lives. And the sad part about that is that then people see Israelis just continuing to live their lives, and they think that the terrorism is not happening, or they think that it's not affecting us when it is. It's just the only way that we can stand up to it. And the best way we can stand up to it is just to keep living our lives. But my family had to move back to the States because the economy had crashed in Israel as a result of the terrorism. So we moved from Jerusalem to Las Vegas. It's a little weird, we cannot acknowledge, from the holy city to the city of sin. It's weird. And uh, I found myself in a different world. I thought I was in America's playground in a very not serious place, having come from a very serious, very tragic reality. And I'm going to be honest with you, I came back to America with a lot of hateful feelings towards Palestinians. Because as far as I was concerned, I was a kid, and what I knew was that Palestinians were killing people, including my friends. It took me a long time to grow up and realize that there are Palestinian terrorists, and then there's Palestinians, and they're not the same thing. Um, it took me many, many years of recovery and therapy to overcome a lot of the hateful feelings that I came out of that conflict with. And I was lucky enough that I was able to do it in, in a safer environment. I, I can't say the same for Israelis and for Palestinians, who when they live in it and they continue to live in it, how hard it is to overcome so, some of those feelings. But I moved back to the United States. We lived in Vegas for a year. We moved to Maryland, another very serious place, right outside of Washington, D.C. Lived there for two years, finished up school there, went off to university. And my first six months at university, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I 
didn't know what I was, where I was going to end up. And about six months in, similar to what's happening outside, there was a planned event on my campus that was anti-Zionist. It was an event against Israel. They put up an apartheid wall on campus called calling Israel an apartheid state and a whole host of other claims that are false. And I found myself in a position where while I had lived and experienced, I didn't understand it. And I woke up to the fact that I didn't know the facts and I didn't know the history. And I decided that I didn't just want to have emotions and passion about something that I didn't understand. And I went on this crazy journey that I've been on now for 16 years to try to understand Israel. And when you try to understand Israel, what you really then need to understand is the Jewish people because Jewish history in that land goes back over 3,000 years. If you want to understand Jewish history, you also have to understand Zionism because Jew Judaism, the Jewish people, Zionism go hand in hand. And even though there are Jews who are not Zionists, that doesn't mean that Jewish people and Zionists doesn't go hand in hand. There are also Jewish atheists in the world, and no one would stand here and say that the Jewish people have nothing to do with God. They also go hand in hand. There are just Jews who choose to reject certain aspects of Jewish people, but that's completely legitimate and okay. Um, and then also to understand Jewish people, Zionism, Israel, the only way to truly understand it is to also understand the Palestinians. Um, and I've spent a lot of time also trying to understand the Palestinian narrative, understand how they feel. Um, after I graduated from university with a degree in Middle Eastern history, I moved back to, the, to, to Israel. I've lived back in Jerusalem now almost for 10 years. And the beauty of that was really diving back into the conflict and being able to really hear many different perspectives, both Israeli and also Palestinian. And going into you know, the PLO offices in Ramallah and sitting down with members of the PLO and hearing what they have to say and going to Bethlehem and sitting in the office of the security forces and hearing what they have to say. And then sitting in a home of a Palestinian who lives right across from the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron, the Cave of the Patriarchs for the Jews, or what would be called for the Muslims, the Ibrahimi Mosque, and sit and listen to his experiences and his stories, and just trying to get as much of an understanding from as many angles as possible of why this conflict is still happening. And I think I've kind of put my finger on it, uh, which is crazy to say, but I think I've put my finger and what I want to lay out, and then I'll open up for questions, is the foundation upon which I rest my understanding, which is a historical foundation. Things, and both things that I'm about to say right now are being denied by people on either side of this conflict. And that's what I think is the problem. So first, just because it's further back, I want to start with Jews are connected to this land. Jews are connected to the land of Israel. You cannot disconnect us from it, okay? So the first foundation is the fact that Jewish history began in that land over 3,000 years ago. We've been living on that land continuously for over 3,000 years. Our language, the language that I speak every single day back home in Israel, the language of Hebrew, is a language that was created in that land. I, as a Jewish person, practice culture and tradition every day, every week, yearly. I practice traditions that come from that land. Jews are indigenous to the land. Again, we've lived there continuously for 3,000 years. It is our home. Okay? And somebody might say, but what do you mean? There's Jews all over the world. There are Jews all over the world. And the reason for that is because Jews were thrown out of their home on multiple occasions. One by the Assyrians in 722 before the Common Era, one by the Babylonians in 586 before the Common Era, and then again by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era and the decades after that. And while the vast majority of us have been scattered around the world, there have always been Jews in that. And to try to disconnect Jews from this land is a crazy notion. To try to say that Jews are colonialists who came from Europe is a crazy concept. Okay? Do not call me a foreigner in my land, please. It's offensive. And by the way, say to an Israeli Jew who's been born and raised there, whose grandparents were born and raised there, and you know what their response is going to be to you? Like, Where am I from then? Where is my home? Because I don't have one in that, in that formula. I don't have one because I'm not from Europe. I've never really been to Europe. I don't, you're, I don't have a relationship with Europe. I'm from here. So Jews have a 3,000 year old history. We were a minority up until a certain point. And in the late 19th century, Jews, after suffering 1,900 years of persecution, decided to return to their homeland. And yes, there were other people there. And that's now the other part of the story. The other part of the story would begin in the 7th century, when Islam emerges in the world. And they're very quickly within that same century, they will engage in Islamic conquest. Okay? And Arab Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula, led by the second Caliph Omar the Great, will come out of the Arabian Peninsula. They will make their way into the land of Israel, which at this point has now been named Palestine. By who? By 
by the Roman Emperor Hadrian in 112 of the Common Era, who decided to change the name from Judea to Philistina, naming it after the ancient enemy, the Jews, the Philistines. So the Arab Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula come up, conquer that territory from now the Byzantine Christians who have ruled it since the fourth century, which are really just the, the Eastern Roman Empire after they adopted Christianity. And Arabs will now settle in that land. Arab tribes will settle in that land. One of them lives about 20 minutes away from me in Jerusalem. They're called the Musibas. They've been living there since the seventh century. They've laid down roots there. And ever since that time, other Arab tribes have also joined those Arab tribes in that land. And they've lived there now, some of them continuously, for over a thousand years. When we get to the late 19th century, the Jews will come in and they will find those Arab tribes there. And eventually, tension will begin between these two populations as a result of both of them feeling that it is their homeland. And it's not just a feeling. It is both their homeland. It is. The 19th century brought with it, really the late 18th into the 19th, and then into the 20th brought with it nationalism. The Jews embraced this idea. Modern-day Jewish nationalism is called modern Zionism. The belief in a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Arabs also developed nationalism. Arab nationalism, what becomes known as pan-Arabism. And throughout the 20th century, Arabs will take on the identity first of Arab, alongside their tribal and religious identities. And then, throughout the 20th century, they will take on additional national identities based on the country that they ended up in. So they become Jordanian, alongside being Arab, alongside being a Husseini, alongside being a Muslim. All of those identities completely legitimate and valid. In the 20s, 30s, and 40s of the British Mandate of Palestine, the people calling themselves Palestinian were the Jews, which makes sense, because the Jews had come from Europe, and the Jews were French Jews and Russian Jews and German Jews, so when they got to Palestine, they became Palestinian Jews. But when Israel was created in 1948, the Palestinian Jews start to refer to themselves as Israelis, that becomes their new national and in the late 50s into the 60s, the Arabs of Palestine will start to refer to themselves as Palestinians. And today, they are now Palestinians under one national identity. There are some Jews who try to deny everything that I just said. There are Jews who try to stand up and say, no, they're all just a bunch of Arab tribes. And they were, and they still are, by the way. They are still Arab tribes. That doesn't mean that they didn't unite into one national group. They did, called Palestinians. And they are there now. So what I put my finger on, I think, is that the biggest challenge that we face today is that, again, everything that I just told you is facts, and you can verify it if you would like to. And I encourage you to, by the way, because you shouldn't believe anyone anything tells you these days. You really shouldn't. And yet, there will always be people who will say, no, you're wrong. They'll either say the Jews have no connection to that land and they should just go back to Europe. And there will always be Jews who say the Palestinians don't have a connection, they can just go to another Arab country because they're really just a bunch of Arabs. And the day that the critical mass in this world and in that land accepts the fact that both these people now have over a thousand years of history in this land, that both of these people feel connected to this land, that both of these people see this land as their homeland, and that both of them have legitimate rights and legitimate claims in that land, that is the day that we will actually be able to get to we are so far away from that. So on that foundation, I will answer questions. On that foundation of mutual recognition. That I dream of the day that that can be recognized by the critical mass. And that both Israelis, Jews, and Palestinians can exercise their rights to self-determination in their homelands. Which is the same land. And that means that both sides are going to have to make sacrifices. Both sides are going to have to compromise. But for the greater good of all of us being able to live better lives and have a better future. That's what I hope to achieve. So I'll leave it there. And I'm really happy to just grill me as the topic is called, because I'm, I'm really excited to take any questions you may have. Yes, please go ahead. Start us off. So, following up on that, that premise, yeah. it doesn't the recognition of the Palestinians having the same right to the land as the Jews? conflict with being a Zionist under your definition of Zionism having to be a Jewish state in the land of Israel? Like, what would be a Jewish state? Is it a Jewish majority, Jewish right. rule, Jewish law? Right. And how do you justify any of those? Great. 
Um, so Jewish state, um, in the way that Zionism used it, was a state with a majority of Jews that has a Jewish character um, and Jewish values. Now that's a whole other conversation also, what are Jewish values? And there would be a dispute within, Jew within the Jewish people about what that means. But the root of it, um, if you look at the modern Zionists, uh, specifically the, one of the main modern Zionists, which was Theodore Herzl, his main impetus for being a Zionist was anti-Semitism. Um, Herzl actually wasn't a Zionist um, up until 1896. Herzl was an assimilated Jew in Vienna. Um, he was born in Budapest. And he believed that actually the answer to anti-Semitism was for all Jews to assimilate. Because he had assimilated and he didn't really face anti-Semitism. Which makes sense, because if you don't act like a Jew, and you don't look like a Jew, and people don't know that you're a Jew, you're not going to face anti-Semitism. And then he went to France, and he witnessed the Dreyfus Affair, where a Jew, just like him, who had fully assimilated into French society, was being brought up on trumped-up charges of treason. And he watched as when he was being brought in and out of the courthouse and walked around the streets of France, he heard people saying, death not to Dreyfus, but death to the Jews. And it dawned on him that no matter how much the Jews assimilate, eventually, they're going to see us as Jews. And they're going to come after us. And I mean, boy, was he right 40 years later, wasn't he? And so the impetus for a Jewish state became this idea that, you know, we've tried to live amongst other people for 1900 years. We've wandered this world looking for a place where we could go where we would actually be safe. And unfortunately, the world never could guarantee us that safety. And when the when a, a society turned against the Jews and outright vocally said, we are going to kill all the Jews, almost no country came to the Jewish aid. And they allowed for six million of us to be slaughtered. And what I think people don't understand about Jews is that there's only 15.6 million of us in this world. And so before the Holocaust, there were 18 million of us. And now then there were 12. And so six million wasn't like a small number. It was a third of our population. So the fear of being wiped out is something that is very real to Jews. And so then why I can say I'm a Zionist and why I believe in a Jewish state in the land of Israel is because I believe in a Jewish state so Jews will always have a place where they can be safe and that there will always be a country that will come to their aid. And the only reason that I'm there is because we spent 1900 years trying to find another way and the world kept slapping us in the face. Now, how does that not contradict with me believing in Palestinian rights? During the evolution of Jewish nationalism and Arab nationalism, the Jews started out by saying, Herzl and others, by saying, we're going to have one Jewish state, and within that country, it will be a democracy. Herzl wrote a book called Al-Tanulak in 1903 that spoke about Arabs and Jews living within the society as equal citizens. Okay? Jabotinsky, who was the leader of the revisionist Zionist movement, wrote a constitution in 1934 for the future Jewish state saying exactly the same thing. In fact, he even said it, the, a Jew would be the prime minister um, and an Arab could be second in command. And he said, and even vice versa, which means he envisioned a Jewish state where an Arab could actually be the prime minister of that country. But there was violence going on. The fact is that starting in 1920, the leader of that, of that area, Hajim al Hussein, the Islamic leader, initiated in, uh, waves of attacks against Jews that led us to understand, the Zionists understand, there are Arabs living in who don't want to live in a Jewish country. And that's very, that, I, I would argue today, that's very legitimate, right? It's legitimate to say, I'm an Arab, I'm a Muslim, I don't want to live in a Jewish country, I want to live in an Arab Muslim country. Fair. The British embraced this as well, which is why then the British made offers to try to share the land. One was in 1937, and I just, I put up slides on purpose so that I could use visual references. Let me just, I'm flipping, there's a bunch of slides that I'm just going to flip through because I just want to have the maps because it makes life easier. Um, the Peel Commission. So this was the first attempt at partitioning the land. And they said, okay, we're going to still recognize Zionism and we'll give you 20%. And we're going to recognize Arab nationalism and we're going to give Arabs 75% of the land. And this was accepted by the Jews, accepted by the Zionists, and it was rejected by the Arabs. And then the second time was 10 years later, after, obviously, World War II and the tragedies that we just spoke about. And there was yet another offer, this time made by the United Nations. 55% would go to the Jews, 45% would go to the Arabs. And the Jewish leadership, again, accepted this plan. The Arab leadership rejected this plan. And then the day after it was passed, it was passed on November 29, 1947, by the 
UN. The day after, the Arabs of Palestine, so militias within the territory between the river and the sea, started attacking Jews, which began the War of Independence. So to me, being a Zionist doesn't mean Jewish state in all of the land. It doesn't have to mean that. For some Zionists, by the way, it does. It absolutely does. Those are the Zionists who reject Palestinian rights in that land. But for some Zionists, they've accepted this from 1937 onwards. They said two-state solution. We believe it's all our homeland, but we would be willing to negotiate and compromise if that meant we could both live here side by side together in peace. You guys can have independence, we can have independence, you can have your self-determination, we can have our self-determination, and we don't have to kill each other. So they're not contradictory. They don't have to be contradictory. But today, we have Palestinians who say, no, all the land is ours, which, by the way, was the reason for the rejections of these offers, was the Arabs saying, no, this is Arab land. The Jews shouldn't have any of it. They shouldn't have 20%, they shouldn't have 55%, they should have none of it. That's why they rejected these offers. The Jews who said, we also believe that it's all our land, but there's another people here, and for the sake of moving forward, and again, not living in a conflict forever, let's negotiate. Let's compromise. So I don't see it as contradictory at all. And I think actually the most dangerous thing that happens today is people creating this zero-sum reality where one side has to win and the other side's going to lose. Instead of coming to the, to the middle ground and saying, both are going to have to compromise a little for, I would argue, great gains, which is freedom and independence and, and self-determination. And so they don't have to be contradictory. But the more we create that reality that it has to be one or the other, we're going to be in this forever. Because neither side's going to go anywhere, and neither side's going to accept that. Could, could I follow up? Sure. So yeah, I, I agree with most of what you said. I'm, I'm Israeli. I, I moved here yeah. a couple of years ago. I've lived in Israel for 22 years. Mm -hmm. so I lived in Israel for 22 years. and. What I see is that it's, I completely agree with the idea of both sides needing to compromise, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't see how you can reconciliate that with still advocating for, staunchly advocating for a Jewish state. Because if you believe in democracy, if you do believe in equal rights for all, well then what, why would you, uh, why would you go against, for example, if there was a situation in which there was an Arab majority? Why would that be? A, it, why would that not be desirable? Uh, it, it, it goes back to what I said initially, which is, as a Jew, the scariest scenario that you could paint for me in this world is a world without a Jewish country. Because I won't go safe. And I have every right to not go safe. And anyone who says otherwise doesn't know Jewish history, doesn't understand anti Semitism. And so, again, the the way that I can justify it is by saying, first of all, I have the right to self-determination, and that is what self-determination is. Self-determination is your people being the majority so that you can have a place where your values, your, your beliefs, um, your culture can be preserved. Right? That's the idea of an ethnic state. Okay? Today, that's been very distorted, and it's made to look as if it's a bad thing because well, we all just need to live together. I don't see it that way. I believe in embracing differences, and I actually think that community is very important. And I think preserving culture is very important. I think once you've watered down people's culture, they lose identity. And once you lose identity, you have nothing to really live for. So I believe in that. I believe in countries being able to preserve their culture. That I believe in nationalism. I do. I'm, I'm a Zionist. I'm a nationalist. Okay? Not in the negative sense of nationalism where you have to take it to the extreme and then discriminate against people. So I believe in a Jewish state, but it has to be a democratic state. So the Jews have to be a majority for the purpose of preserving that Jewish character. But that in no way means that you force that Jewish character upon minorities within your country. And I'm proud to see that Israel, when it was founded, said that there would be equal rights no matter people's race, religion, or gender. I'm proud to say that I actually think Israel upholds freedom of religion more than this country does, which they do, because I live in a place where Arabs, Muslims, can sound off their call to prayer at 4 o'clock in the morning from their mosques, which they can't do in this country. But in my country, they can. I'm, I'm proud to say that it is a democracy, and I am an advocate of both Jewish statehood as well as a Jewish democratic state. So the character is going to be Jewish. And, and that's always going to be hard for minorities. It's hard for any minorities, just like it's hard in this country for minorities when you're walking around and it's Christmas time, and well, it's Christmas time. But we're a minority. So I'm not going to go like burn down a Christmas market because it doesn't represent me. I'm going to accept that I'm a minority in a country where the majority is Christian, and they should be able to celebrate their holidays. 
So embracing differences. And I don't think, and so for me, but again, it's always gonna go back. When somebody says, why are you a Zionist? The fundamental is, I need a place where I can be safe. And the world demonstrated after 1900 years that they can't guarantee me that. And I don't trust them. And if somebody doesn't understand that, you really need to go and learn Jewish history. Because we've tried. Sorry, I'm just gonna, but Not I'll sure. come back to it. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, I have a question. Now, I personally came from South Korea, where mm -hmm. we still have a huge threat of being wiped out, well, mm -hmm. especially a person like myself. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about it, South Korea is the only bloc of the land in Asia that faces um, the three biggest bloc in, um, in the whole world, you know, Russia, China, and um, North Korea. Yeah. Now, I do understand what you're talking about. I do, of course. The thing is, in South Korea, um, South Korea always has
if somebody intentionally targets a Palestinian child, they will be and should be if they are not. They will be prosecuted for it. There was a man named Amram ben Uziel, I should even say his name, Amak Shemot. He was a Jewish terrorist. He decided about 10 years ago to light a house on fire that had a Palestinian family inside, the Dawabsha family. Both parents were killed. Most of their children were killed, including a baby. That man is serving a lifetime sentence and he will never be released from an Israeli jail. But when a Palestinian terrorist looked through a sniper gun at a family, two parents, the passes, that was their last name, they were pushing a pram with their 10 month old shot head. And when that sniper looked through his scope and could choose the adult male, the adult female, or the 10 month old, his first shot was at Shalhevet's head. And he murdered the 10 month old first. Then he proceeded to shoot her father in the leg for us. And when that man is celebrated as a hero, I, I'm not going to justify extremism. I'm just not. I, I think it's so wrong. I lost three friends in one suicide bombing. I have not turned extreme. I don't hate Palestinians. I still think that we need to make compromises for peace. But I can understand why some and why some people think maybe it's not worth it. We pulled out of Gaza in 2005, and what's happened since is that territory was taken over by terrorists. It's been run into the ground. Palestinians that are suffering every single day as a result, and every so often they decide, decide to fire rockets at Israel that starts an operation and then draws in an Israeli response, not to battlefields, but to cities, because that's where they're firing the rockets from. And innocent people die in the process. So for Israelis, there are some who say, we've given up land, and all it's resulted in is more violence. So why should we give up more land? And so the, the internal issues of extremism in Israel are something we have to tackle internally, internally through education. That's my perspective as an Israeli. And as much as it might look like Israel has turned more extreme, maybe because of this new government that we just created, we have to understand that the far right party, which was three parties put together, that got elected, was voted by only 10% of the country. Now to me, that's still too much. Like one in, in, in 10 people, that's still too much. That's the message to us and to me as an Israeli that I have to do a better job inside of Israel. The last thing that I want to say though, is like you said, South Korea. I can also say America as an American. I can also point to a far right that is growing in America. I can point to Italy, to a far right that's growing in Italy. I can point, I can point to France, to the far right that's also growing in France. This is a phenomenon that's happening in many different countries, and every country has to tackle it, I would say again, through education, to, to try to bring their extremists off the ledge. It is a global challenge that we're facing right now because of polarization. And, and I work every day, not just outside of Israel, but inside of Israel, to try to minimize that extremism. We have to work hard. We have to work hard. That's all I can say. Yeah. Ooh, okay. I'll hand you some. In the back. Uh, how do you keep Israel Jewish? How do you keep Israel Jewish? Yeah. Um, it, it's a, first of all, through education. Again, you guys are going to be hearing the same answer a lot, by the way. Through education. Um, you know, I, I and, and I would say not through legislation. Um, I, I think forcing a religion upon somebody through legislation is the worst way to try to keep anyone as part of that people. Um, the other way is very simple, it's through immigration. Um, Israel is very, very strict in terms of who can immigrate to Israel. And as of now, the immigration laws are pretty simple. If you're Jewish, you can immigrate to Israel and become an automatic citizen of the state. If you are not Jewish, you can move to Israel and become a resident, but you cannot, usually it would take a very long time, if ever, to become a citizen. So the Arabs who live in Israel are 23% of the population. Um, when we started out, they were 160,000. That's the, that was when we gave out citizenship initially. That's what it, that was how the Arabs were in the country. Today they're about 2 million, 2.2 million or so within the country. And um, they have full and equal rights. And if, if the other way to become an Israeli is if you marry an Arab, if you marry an Israeli, so if you marry an Arab Israeli or marry a Jewish Israeli, you could get this uh, Israeli citizenship. Which does happen. Um, and, and so. Uh, what is going to come 6 more percent of the population? What is the. And we're going to have to. We're going to have to. I can't. I struggle with crystal ball questions because the demographics say that that won't happen for like over 100 years. So what we 
see is our birth rates um, in Israel dropping. Go on, it's okay, go on. Jewish birth rates um, are remaining higher, they're the highest of all OECD countries. Um, we're at like 3.4. Um, and so, sorry. Um, so, again, I, it's like there's so much to deal with. So let me cross that out when I get there. Um, but the one thing is, it, it could happen. And then we have to reckon with it when it does. And then it wouldn't be a Jewish state anymore. Because for me, I'm not going to settle for a Jewish state that's not democratic. So if they become the majority, they become the majority, and that's on us for not doing a good enough job at maintaining our majority. But you can't do it through legislation. You can't stop them from having kids. So the only way is through immigration and through encouraging Aliyah, through encouraging Jews to immigrate to Israel, which there is an entire branch. There's a, a body that works around the world to encourage Jews to move to Israel and to have children. Um, and that's, that's, but again, once it happens, it happens. And then we're not, we're not a Jewish state anymore. And then we're back to living in a very scary world for Jews. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. It can happen. Jews have gone to what is today Kenya. Um, how long would it have taken people to 
probably would have worked better, and probably it's something that they would have risen up and said there to as they have always, everywhere else that we've gone. And we wouldn't have had to answer that question, right? Um, and the last thing about the Mossad, like you said, nobody's speaking clean. Uh, Counterterrorism is dirty, dirty, dirty work uh, because you're dealing with dirty, dirty, dirty people. And when they hunt you down Nazis, yeah, you can hunt down Nazis as far as I'm concerned. You're dealing with dirty people and they deserve to be hunted. Um, and I think there's a lot of conspiracy theories that revolved around the Mossad that people need to really shut aside. Um, when there's verifiable evidence, we can talk about it. When there's not, we need to really put conspiracy theories aside. Um, but the last thing that I'll say is every country has its own external security force, international security force, you guys have an I-6, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah? Um, America has the CIA, Israel has the Mossad. They are all doing things that we probably wouldn't be okay with. Um, they're doing it for your protection. Um, and yes, we can have a conversation about it, but to act as if the Mossad is unique in any way is also wrong because every country who faces threats has their own external force that is out there in the world spying to be able to try to minimize the threat. And Israel is definitely a country that has been continuously threatened since its existence. So they are going to do that just like any other country would. So I would just always say, put it on the same level as anybody else. It's a country like everybody else. Sometimes they do good, sometimes they do bad. And uh, we need to judge them accordingly. Yes? Yes? Okay. Uh, you said a bit ago that um, also Israel has more religious freedom than the UK. To a certain extent. I mean, in some areas, yeah. Okay. And I give an example. How can you even make that claim when? Over the past two years during Ramadan, Al-Aqsa Mosque has been attacked by Israeli police. Yeah, um, so first of all, since you brought it up, the Temple Mount, that's actually the place where people are discriminated against, but not Muslims, um, Jews and Muslims. Christians. I'm, I'm about to explain it. Um, Jews are not allowed to go up to the Temple Mount and pray. Uh, neither are Christians. So in fact, the people whose freedom of religion is most infringed upon in Israel are Jews and Christians on the Temple Mount. So they got shot up? Um, yeah, actually, a uh, Palestinian went up onto the Temple Mount a few years ago and shot two police officers who were trying to protect the mountain. Yeah, well, so, know, so, let, let be, is. yeah. Um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, unfortunately, has been used by rioters. The Al-Aqsa Mosque should be a protected site. It should be a place of, of holy prayer. It should be a place where Worshippers are free to pray freely and safely. I encourage everyone to look up photos from inside of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on May 10th of 2021. That's the day we were talking about. And I also encourage May 10th, 2021. I remember because that's the day that rockets were launched at me. Uh, when Hamas said, if you do not leave the Temple Mount Plaza, we are going to attack you. And they did. You know how many I, I'm not, I'm, in Gaza died? I, I do, but do you know notice, how many, do you know the number I do, it's 254. Yeah. I know the exact number. Yeah, those were kids. With all due respect, yeah. with all due respect, there is a, a, a timeline, okay. and you can't jump to the end of it. And the end of it was what happened in Gaza. On, at 6.10 p.m. on May 10th, nothing was going on in Gaza. Nothing. That was the okay. moment. Hold on, that was the moment that, yeah, there's, there's been a blockade going on since, since 2007, the, the day that Hamas took over that territory by force. And there's been a blockade to prevent them from being able to get weapons to initiate these conflicts, which then lead to unfortunate casualties in Gaza. On May 10th, we had nothing, there was nothing going on in Gaza. At 6.10 p.m., Hamas fired rockets at Jerusalem. I know, because I watched as they were blown out of the sky. It took six hours, excuse me, five hours. At 11 p.m. that night, Israel will fire its first attack in Gaza against Hamas. And a 16-day conflict ensues. Against Hamas. And in that conflict, against Hamas. Okay. And in that, the, the 254 Palestinians were killed. About 150 of them were terrorists, named by Hamas as terrorists. About 100 of them were innocent civilians. And that is tragic. There's no other way to, there's no, if anyone tries to say otherwise, they are a despicable human being, as far as I'm concerned. 45 of those innocent people were killed in one strike. 
The strike wasn't aimed at them. It was aimed at a tunnel dug by Hamas nearby an apartment building. The tunnel was destroyed, and the building nearby was unfortunately destabilized and it collapsed. It wasn't targeted, it wasn't intentional. Does not, nothing that I just said matters. 45 innocent people lost their lives. If Hamas had not fired those rockets at 6 10 p.m., nothing would have happened in Gaza. Perhaps they wouldn't have fired those rockets, though. If so now let's go back, because again, when I told you there was a time, so now let's keep going back, right? That's now let's go back. Okay. Sure. Um, can we just, I, I know yeah. it seems like you have quite a lot to say, I think because it's getting a little bit back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to have okay. um, about 30 seconds or so to speak and make a case for it. I just, I, I want to answer his original question. Yeah, yeah, I think, but I think I the best just... way to run this, um, run yeah, yeah, this yeah, sure. is if you get a bit of time to speak, so I'm not sure you show sure. your name. Uh, Paris. Paris. Um, so if you get, if we just let him have about 30 seconds sure. to speak, that is actually well. I just want to answer the original yeah. question about the, the Allies the most. Well, yeah, because this so, happened, I think this uh, Hamas was retaliating against the Israeli, right. you know, military. So then we have to keep going back, right? Yeah. So, so if you look at, it was the end of Ramadan, May 10th was actually the last day of Ramadan. Okay. I'm not sure if it was the last day. It, it, oh no, excuse me, it was, it was two days later, Thursday was going to be the last day, so it was Monday. And Thursday was going to be the other day. It wasn't the no, no, it was, it was coming up. The last day was Wednesday. It was coming Thursday. up, yeah. um, If you go back to the Friday, okay, that is when the first real rioting started to take place on the Temple Mount. Okay? So if you see, actually, every year when Ramadan hits, Israel actually gives out significantly more permits for worshippers who want to go pray on the Al-Aqsa Why do they need a permit? Because you're crossing into somebody else's country. I don't need a permit to go to the mosque either. Because you're not. If, sorry, again, the back and forth. I don't. Mm. I, if you're okay, right, you're happy to I'm okay. This way. I'm just trying to. You keep asking, so I'm going to address the questions. But if you want to go to a mosque in Bristol, of course, you're not crossing a border, right? You're not crossing into somebody else's territory. But if you wanted to go to a mosque in America, you'd have to go through a border crossing, right? You'd have to get a visa to go and be able to do that, right? It's the same idea. So if you're going to come into somebody else's territory, you need to get a permit to be able to do that. That's just international law. Like, that's everywhere. So you have to get a permit to go into a territory that's under Israeli control, and then to go up, out, up, up onto the mosque, which is controlled by an Islamic trust. The mosque itself and the platform itself is controlled by the Islamic trust, the law from Jordan. Hold on, let me, again, let's, so we give permits, people come. Then that year, there were rioters. Now again, I implore everyone to look this up, you can find it on your phones, that they were mass stockpiling rocks inside of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's rocks and other ammunition, fireworks and other things. So on Friday, what happened was, excuse me, some Sunday night, what happened, it was a Jewish holiday also celebrating Jerusalem, and rioters broke out on the Temple Mount where there are Jews, there weren't Jews, there can't be Jews up there at that time. And fireworks were, were literally set off and shot at police officers on the Temple Mount, along with rocks and other projectiles and Molotov cocktails. The police then respond. And when a rioter, and on May 10th, rioters continuously did this, rioters then ran into the Al-Aqsa Mosque to take shelter from the police, and the police eventually had to go into the mosque to disrupt and end the violent rioters that they had been experiencing. With all due respect, every day, since May of 2021, Arab Muslims, Palestinians, have been able to go up and pray peacefully. Did anyone hear today about us disrupting peace on the temple, uh, prayer on the Temple Mount? What about yesterday? What about the day before? Why you won't, you won't, you won't. It doesn't happen every day. Why? Why did it happen? Because when riots break out, it is our responsibility to restore order. And the police will go in and restore order. Well, I've seen the videos of the police restoring order and, uh, you know, it's harrowing the footage. It's not, you know, young men. It's like old women with, who have been shot in the eye and stuff with rubber guns. Unfortunately, when riots break out and there are innocent people, it is a chaotic environment. And as a result, innocent people will be harmed. Then, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to just take another question because we've done enough back and forth. Just as long as just trying to be respectful of everybody else. I will in no way ever condone police brutality. And I have also seen videos myself of police going way too far 
and how they deal with riders. But I also have seen very legitimate evidence to show that they have, they must stop people who are firing fireworks at them. They have to. That's their lives, and it's the lives of also the innocent people around them. This is not an easy thing. I don't know if you've ever been in a riot or if you've ever had to do riot control, but it's not an easy thing to do. And innocent people will get harmed in the process. But we do everything in our power to not harm innocent people. And every day, Israel is making effort to ensure that if you want to go up and worship on the Temple Mount, if you're a Muslim, because if you're Jewish or Christian, you can't. But if you're a Muslim and you want to go pray in Al-Aqsa, they every day try to ensure that you have the freedom to do so. And every day you do. And you can go up there now. And every day, people pray there peacefully. On May 10th, and in the days leading up to May 10th, they couldn't because it was disrupted, not by the police, but by rioters who used the Al-Aqsa Mosque as a base for their riot. And that should be the thing that there is uproar about. The uproar should be that inside the mosque, rocks are being stockpiled for the purpose of, fire, of, of, of throwing them at the Jews. That should be the, uh, the outrage. That's where it should lie. Why are you using a mosque? And if you didn't, then the police would never have to step foot in that mosque. And they didn't yesterday, and they won't tomorrow, and they didn't the day before. Because we want everyone to be able to pray and worship for you. And you see that throughout Israel, and I'm, I'm proud of it. And it upsets me dearly when things like that happen. It shouldn't happen. And I hope that it never happens again. Where do I go? Yeah. And then Zabra can talk to you. Massacred by their neighbors, by their Arab neighbors. 
So, the, so again, like, is it occupation? Is it the Jewish state existing? Is it just Jews living there? Like, what, right? And then if you keep going back, you get to the, the first of all, Jews were living there, right? I mean, again, historically, Jews have always lived in the land. And if you go to the mid 1800s, mid 19th century, you have about 30,000 Jews living there. And then comes this first big wave of Jewish immigration in 1882 that, that goes on for about 20 years until 1903. And it's in that window of time that we're going to start to see tension really build between these two populations, right? Some, by the way, not at all. Some got along. Others didn't. You start to see killing. Where did the killing come from? Usually it was land disputes that caused it, like land demarcation, where does your land end? Where does it? So you can keep going back. But once you get to I mean, there's a point where it's like, okay, but why did the killing begin altogether? And it was, again, this element of these people are coming to our land that we believe belongs to us and are taking it from us. Now, the Jews were purchasing land, but if you were an Arab on that land and somebody, an absentee an Arab landowner, sold that land from under your feet, and then a Jew shows up and says, this is my land now, you're going to feel like your land is being taken away from you, and you might turn back as a result. So, again, in the broader conflict, I think there is an answer to who's, who, where did the violence begin. And in, in modern times, again, you have to go back to the escalation. Because people try to paint it as every single day people are dying. And that's just not true. It's just not true. Even now, you can say right now there's, there's been, and I, right now I can say there has been an escalation. The escalation has been about a six-month escalation. It started in March. Right? Well, what did it start with? It started with a, a stabbing, with a stabbing attack that occurred in Beth Sheva, in, in Israel proper, that took the lives of five people. Then there was another terrorist attack inside Israel. Then there was another. And then Israel launched an operation in the West Bank called Operation Breakwater, which they've been engaged in for the last six months. Prior to the terrorist attack in Beth Sheva, you're not going to see the same reality that we had since. That's the marking point, right? And so, to me, it's, you have to look at the escalations. And where did it begin? And, and then the last thing that I want to say is like, I just will never, ever be okay with people justifying the murder of innocent people. I will just never be okay with it. I don't care if you're Jewish, I don't care if you're Palestinian, if your intention is to go and kill an innocent person, I will condemn you for it. And the saddest part is that we live in a world now where when I talk about terrorism and I say innocent Israelis are being targeted and killed, your response is, yeah, but. And that shouldn't be the response. This should be, the response should be, that's not okay. You want to you wanna speak out against the army? You want to protest? You have every right to do that. You don't have the right to kill innocent people. And I, again, I would say it to a Jew who's Who's, who goes and commits a terrorist attack, which again, there's, it's rare, so I don't have to do it often, thank God. And I would say it's a Palestinian. And so, no matter what, there's no justification for it. And we need to stop allowing people to just justify it away. I, I said Sabri was next. Uh, I'm oh, just being conscious of time. Yes. Um, there's obviously, there's quite a lot of people who've got hands up. Yeah, so yeah, why don't we absolutely. take maybe two questions at a time? So we can try and get um, as many people to... Yeah, I'm really bad at remembering them, so if you can remember that's them, that's fine, but I'll, I'll have shorter answers. Okay, cheers. Yeah, got it. So yeah, ask, what yeah do you think? sorry, it's just, everyone always says, but it's more complicated than that, so then I, I then I, they I, all I, shorten I, I, it, I so I'm in, like, this battle. But yes, I'll go all, yeah. What do you think went wrong in Israeli society that we have Ben Gvir and Smotrich yeah. who've said incredibly racist things, and not just yeah. those two, but also part of like Noam as part of religious Zionism. Yeah, well, they've now broken up again, by the way. So there are now three separate parties, and Noam is one guy. Um, and one guy who holds incredibly, I would say, in terms of just values, he's, a hom he's homophobic, he is probably homophobic, anti-LGBTQ, not great. Um, that element, by the way, always has existed within the Jewish people, because there's an element of Jewish tradition that says that LGBTQ is wrong. Um, and there's some who have embraced that as so that we reject that community. And there's others who have said, okay, there's an interesting element here, but the Judaism things are never black and white, so let's figure out the gray and let's learn about it. And that's the other part of Israeli society, and I would say the majority of Israeli society. 
But then you also have the ultra-orthodox, so we're going to feel similar because of that ultra-orthodox element of reading it by the letter. Um, what brings about an individual like, like Ben here is kind of what I said when answering this question of the element of we've tried, we've tried, we've tried, and this guy's coming out saying, forget any agreements, we just have to be more proudly Jewish, we need to protect ourselves more aggressively. What brings it about is six months of terrorism. And by the way, I'm not justifying it. I'm really not. I, I just, I don't get it because for me, more extremism brings out more extremism, but that's my perspective. Who voted predominantly for Ben Beer? Young people. Young people and people in the army. People who are driven more by their emotions, less by logic. But a man who comes out saying, I'm gonna be proudly Jewish and I'm gonna protect you at a time when people feel unsafe, you win. Even when you might be, can be deplorable in other areas. And Ben Gvir, the fact that he had a photo of a terrorist, hang, a Jewish terrorist hanging up in his house until two years ago, is despicable. And the only reason he took it down was for political reasons. It's despicable. There's no justifying it, there's no explaining it. And when people say, oh, I voted for him in spite of that, but you voted for him. But what brought the rise of it was a serious attack on personal security in Israel, and a lot of Israelis feeling frustrated that the government hasn't done enough about it. Smotrich has a very wide base. Some who are not racist at all, and who literally went to the voting booth and was like, this is the only guy who represents me, so I'm gonna vote for him because there's no other person who represents me in the government. Because if you're a religious Zionist and you believe in settlements, and you believe in that element of Jewish you know, settlement on the land, there's nobody else that represents you other than him. And you have to like kind of vote with him even though he's a racist, which again, I don't understand, but some people, they went like this, and other people, they're like, they, they're like, is he really racist? Is what he said really racist? And then they do that, you know? Um, but again, the environment in Israel of 75 years of trying to create peace with our neighbors, coming from the left, and it failing every step of the way, not just failing, but terrorism continuing, has pushed people to the right. So yeah. one counterpoint. Yeah. Compared to the second intifada 20 years ago, terrorism is much less. Oh, I know. And also across the, uh, from um, Israel's founding until the 2000s, there's been much higher terrorism than the, p the previous. Well, wait, so there was like the 1970s, which were like the 50s, there was a time period where it was really bad, the 1970s got really bad. But then suicide bombing started in the 90s. And dude, let me tell you, I say that these young people are like, I don't feel safe. I'm like, I'm a child of the intifada. You don't know what it means to feel unsafe. I, I seriously, I say that, I'm sorry. Like, I feel, I feel the, the notion of voting for these people because of personal security, like, I feel very safe. I don't live in the South under rocket fire or under the fear of balloons coming over and setting my fields on fire. But young people, that's what they're driven by. You just said it. And so I, I hear you. I, I, it's, it's nowhere close to what it was like during the Intifada. And so the notion that this is how far we've gotten, but again, the left was still, there was still a strong base of, no, we can do this. This is just extremists. We can still make peace. The Intifada, by the way, is what started to turn. Left wingers have said to me in Israel, I was on the left. I believed in the two state solution. I really did believe that it could happen until the second Intifada. So when you ask where was the turn, it was the second Intifada in multiple ways because a lot of left wingers gave up hope. Many of them left the country, by the way, moved to America, moved to here, and they make up the left wing base of America of, of Jews, of diaspora Israeli Jews, okay? And we were left with more right wingers in Israel. I'm not saying right, by the way, is bad. Far right, people who express support for violence, homophobia, and racism, I'm gonna draw the line there. But that's bad. It's, it's the circumstances of our history and all of the failures and so many Israelis just being fed up and feeling like there's no answer. So we just need to protect ourselves strongly, we need to be fiercely Jewish, because that's the only way forward. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm gonna do three and then I'm gonna be done. Go, Andrew. Um, hi, first thing, very much what you said, and despite what you said so far being very, very informative, do you not agree that actually this event has never really had any chance of really gaining any meaningful dialogue? Because if people, I wish people outside could hear what you said so far, but if people's initial impressions stand with us, is their Instagram page, which is a collection of reports on car rammings in the West Bank, and the NBA basketball players, yet has, and they're exaggerated between what they need for a state of Israel, without any significant criticism or recognition of the danger of the election of Benjamin Portrait to the government and the danger that poses to both our, you know, our collective, both the people outside and people inside, need and want for a two-state solution. Is it really there? This has no chance of any significant dialogue at all. I think people need to step away from the world of social media and realize that the world is out there. So I'm talking about Sam Rothman. No, I, 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 I'm not. That's exactly what I'm saying. If you think that an educational organization can do the same thing that they do in the classroom and do it online in, in, in an environment like TikTok and Instagram, you're delusional. So, and, and then, 
confident in how we're going to solve that. There's a much bigger fight outside of the world than inside of the world. And the challenge that Sam has always had, I still, I, I fight it from within all the time, is how do I put out what I would call very constructive criticism of Israel, where that it's going to be taken by somebody and used to delegitimize my country and say that Israel shouldn't exist. That is a balance that we have yet to be able to find this time. Because it's a genuine fear. Because I've seen it happen that way. I've actually seen it happen. Where we posted stuff and it's been used against Israel's existence. So we try. We try. When there was growing when there was growing violence in the West Bank in the beginning of this year, Stan with us put out a post that didn't just say there's growing violence in the West Bank and talk about Palestinian violence. They also we also talked about Jewish settler violence in the same post. Okay, we're, we're trying. And if you have criticism, what I would say is come be part of it. We have fellows who criticize us all the time, and we listen to their criticism and we try to. The other thing that I just want to say is social media is beyond just Instagram. My videos are on social media. My talks like this are on social media. To, to argue that the people out there who are protesting are doing it because they don't like Sam with us is, is really nice. Because all they had to hear was that Zionist was coming to campus. They didn't mention anything about Sam with us. They mentioned that I was just like a bitch Zionist. And the problem was that I was Zionist. So with all due respect, it's a little naive to say that the reason that they're not in this room is because I don't stand up. The reason that they're not in this room is because I'm a Zionist. And they don't want to die about the Zionists because they think that Zionism at its core is evil. Can and I, if. Sorry, I'm not necessarily referring to that, but I think that's like enormously probably not going to have much change. The people that need to speak, that you, that you need to have these people, all these conversations, are the people who are not in the room, who are the people who are totally. Um, to explain it to people 
and to say, look, if this happens, we'll see what plays out. But I have to wait to see what plays out. Here's what they've been saying, and this is scary because of X, Y, Z. We'll see how it plays out. And when it plays out, we as an organization are going to have to tackle it every single time. And it is a careful battle. And if, if anyone thinks that it is an easy thing to put together that kind of strategy in the polarized world that we are in, you have another problem. It's hard. But I have strategy meetings on the books for next week when I get back to Israel to talk about as senior educator with our other educators, how are we going to properly tackle this issue? But our criticism usually remains for within a circle of Zionists who actually know and care. I don't need to air my criticism out to a world that doesn't understand it. And it's going to use it against me. So UJS and JSOC and other Zionists should sit together and discuss these issues. And rip things apart. Because it's coming from a good place. And that's the appropriate place to do it. And so we will do it internally. We will do it inside the classroom. We will do it in a place where it's actually made. Okay. And I promise you will. And well, if we move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah. So we've got two more. So two two more and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so let me see the context about the world that's happening. So China and the Uyghurs have mm -hmm. um, a million people pledged in these camps. Right, yeah. um, Erdogan, the Kurds, and mm -hmm. even that India, Kashmir, happened similar times in these camps. China will definitely be the kind of time to put every piece of this outside. I think the first thing outside. How much of these protests would you say are sparked by actual sympathy mm -hmm. and then how much would you say these protests are sparked by anti-Semitism? I would say a minor, a, a, a minority is, is anti-Semitism, a small minority, a large minority is um, parts being tugged at and a lack of all of the information. Um, I am a firm believer that the vast majority of people are not anti-Semitic. I'm a firm believer that the vast majority of people in this world are uninformed or misinformed. And that is where why I do what I do. So then why are you doing Um, because there are people out there who are anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist who want to misinform them. Now they don't think they, they might know that they're misinforming them, they might not. But I think Gerbils was well aware of him, the fact that he was misinforming people about the Jews to achieve a greater goal. Right? So there's always going to be those people who are doing it very knowingly. And then there's going to be those people who unfortunately fall to it because the people who are doing it knowingly know how to appeal to people's emotions. And I talk fast. I try a little bit with the emotion, but it's hard for me. And I talk fast and well, I, I, you know, most people will listen to me speak and I will say a lot of facts and they'll walk out and 10 years later the only thing that they remember is the fact that I lost three friends in a suicide bomb. Because that was the moment during my talk that they felt so there are people who want to spread the misinformation and there are people who are susceptible to it, especially in this day age. And we have a natural tendency as human beings to want to align ourselves with the underdogs and it's deeply embedded in psychology. And the way that they have framed this conflict is there's a good guy and there's a bad guy, there's an oppressor and there's an oppressed. And the sad part is, is that it's just more complicated. There are people who are victims on both sides of this conflict and there are bad, bad people. And we need to marginalize the bad on both sides. And we need to protect the innocent on both sides. That needs to be the conversation on this. Or in one last question. Um, so you said that at the beginning of the speech, uh, and you seem to have been there a little bit. Uh, at the beginning, you said that we should see this as a Palestinian national movement. But then you need to describe it. I think something in the West. Jew, who 
you know, it's not for me to come and tell Arabs and Palestinians how they should govern themselves. But there are other countries that will. Just say we could keep going until nine. Yeah, so we do have the room until nine, but thank you so much for what you've said so far. So if there's anything else that anybody really wants to say, um, doesn't necessarily have to be kind of QA type if you've sure. had anything time. Well, you while to you're make. in England if you're not here often. What? If you're in England and you're not here often, I recommend going to Brick Lane in London. There's this place called Bagel Bay or something. <laughs> 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 Yeah, 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 and they do like it's a scene, like it's uh, not like not kosher. Really no. Just that, just that. Big slices. Sorry. Yeah. But like, I appreciate the, the recommendation. Themselves. Thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen a Wes Anderson film? Uh, <laughs> director? Which one? Uh, Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, I haven't. I've heard about it. Haven't seen it. Yeah, I was gonna. It's ask with Stillers, that. right? Say again. With Ben Stiller. No. Ben Stiller. That I didn't think on that one. But, um, oh no, that was keeping up with the Steinses. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Oh, you did the bay with the Jewish stereotypes of Hollywood. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I don't know. How does that kind of link into the kind of um, 
kind of uh, Zionist discourse? Is it like weakening because it means that there could be like a kind of, you know, everyone just moves to New York and LA and North London? Or is it just like, just fine? Are in they kind of, of like uh, intermingling? Because intermingling? I've no. So here's sorry. the thing Jews have to self segregate because if you're yeah. a religious Jew, you have to live within walking distance of a synagogue. Mm -hmm. So there's one synagogue within the vicinity there's going to be a lot of Jews because any Jew who practices and observes has to be walking distance from that synagogue. Yeah. And then kosher restaurants are going to pop up and you won't live, you know what I mean? So Jews self-segregate for that reason, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we also intermingle, yeah. right? So, um, and then there's some who don't want to intermingle because they believe that intermingling leads to outmarriage, which then leads to a reduction in the Jewish population in the world, which is happening. Um, so it just depends. It depends on your your bland, your style of wanting to go about about it. That wasn't the right word, bland. I don't know where that came from. Sorry, I'm tired. Um, but it's about your style. And so I believe, like I've been intermixed in the world. I was acculturated, as you will, not assimilated, because I very much maintained my Jewish tradition. Um, and I will only marry Jewish. And but I've been in a world where I, I interact with non-Jews every day. But when somebody's not Jewish, I very much put them out of the category of marriage, and they are just now friends. There's some people who think, no, if you do that, you're susceptible, and eventually you might, and so they keep their kids insulated. It just depends. Um, it's just different ways of, of going about practicing. Um, but I do believe, I mean, in acculturation, and I, I believe that the only way people are going to understand who Jews are is if, is if more Jews are out there as Jews in the world, wearing their scarves, Wearing their kippot, their kippot and, and, and talking about what it means to be a Jew. Um, that's the only way. You know what I mean? Because that's people aren't going to know who Jews are unless we tell them who Jews are. Oh, and yeah. the only way they're going to know how to ask is if you tell them that you're Jewish or you are visibly Jewish. Yeah, definitely. I so. wish you could, uh, it would be easier to go around and see, you know, you could just see, um, uh, I think they're called Hasidim. Hasidim, we call yeah. Them, uh, Ultra Orthodox. We they're Haredi or Hasidic. Yeah, just walking around. Yeah, I mean they do, but they also like maybe not. They don't speak English. They might speak Yiddish. Mm. They again, it's it's a it's a different way. It's a different mentality of preservation. Um, sure. And and even the most, by the way, insular Hasidic Haredi Jews, some of their kids will choose to step outside of that of that way of life and and acculturate into society. So it's just, I mean, but but again, I think something that a lot of non-Jews struggle with it's like why are the jews so scared about like jewish continuity I and it's because there's is. only 15.6 million jews in the world and so for jews like when you say that to somebody who might be christian or muslim or from another country like a chinese person they're like it's not even a thought in their heads right because there's like two billion christians and there's almost two billion muslims and there's like a, a billion chinese people and so they're not sitting there thinking like, oh, one day my people might disappear. For Jews, that is something that has been at the forefront of Jewish society for our entire existence. How do we make sure that there are still Jews in this world? And that is something that, again, I, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of people don't even realize that that's at such the core of who the Jewish people are. And, and so, and so we, we deal with it in different ways. Um, but it's definitely a constant conversation, um, and it's and it, it's a little scary. And it's a little scary when you have 18 million Jews before the Holocaust, 12 million Jews after, and now it's been 75 years, 80 years, and we're only at 15.6, mm -hmm. and we're still being threatened. So there's so much behind just why Jews are the way that they are. So it's a whole other conversation. Yeah. yeah, so um, I would just like to say, um, as far as I am aware, stepping outside of an ultra-Orthodox community when you're raising it as a child is a very hard thing. And I just don't really think that the, I just don't really think that continuity can be used to justify, you know, hiding your child away from the rest of the world. Like how, so how do you deal with this issue that, you know, as a, as a child, they are a person, and they need to be. They they, they need to have. They, they have the right to access everything. They yeah. I mean yes. I I think this is again. This is an ongoing debate. First of all, 
let's not like, I'm not assuming that this is you. I'm just going to say this broadly. People need to stop learning about Jews on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Unorthodox. Um, what's the other one about that really tackles this issue? Of, 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 no, that's one of the better ones. Um, no, it's another one of the better ones, but also white. Um, it was it was about. I mean, they they really they really dove into people who have left the ultra orthodox community and how the ultra orthodox the backlash that they'll experience, which is sort of horrific. And and there's there's no justification for it. I'm sorry. If someone wants to leave, they should be able to leave. Okay. And there should be no punishment when you step outside. That being said, I think if you spoke to a lot of the ultra orthodox who are raised that way, they would say, I don't want to. I don't want to. Like I don't I don't need I don't need that world. Um, genuinely, I, I don't need to be a part of the outside world. I like our traditions. I like our way of life. And, and that's, that's also their right, right? It's also their right to not step outside. And so I think everyone should be given that choice. And there shouldn't be punishment if you choose to step outside. That's where the ultra-Orthodox community has gone way wrong. And so, and there's a lot of wrong within the ultra-Orthodox community, just like there's a lot of wrong within the Hall community or the conservative community or the traditional community. Every one of them deals with these things differently. I mean, there are parents who, when their kid comes and says, I'm not going to marry a Jew, their parents completely reject them and, and cut them off entirely. It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging reality, and I think, again, it's very hard to understand unless you take a deep dive into understanding Jewish history. And when you say, I don't think Jewish continuity, it, that should never justify the punishment or, or the shunning, but at the same time, their community is, this is how we are. So if you're not gonna be like this, then, then you're gonna have to leave the community. Um, and, and, and to a certain extent, that makes sense because when you, when, I mean, we've all seen it, you dilute a community, it becomes diluted. And traditions become diluted. And in the Jewish tradition, we've definitely seen this also happen. So it's a challenge, it's a, it's a huge challenge that we face as Jews, but Jewish continuity is definitely a good reason to, to, to be concerned and to have certain things that we are trying to implement to ensure that Jews continue. But I think there's a proper way to go about it, and I would argue it's education, and there's a not so proper way, which is punishment, which doesn't really work. And so it's, it's, it's really about our community embracing that. As, as, and, I, and one of the people that I really implore anyone in this room to read who I think dives into this issue in one of the most brilliant ways is Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of this country, who has written many books on Jewish continuity that I think would help people truly understand the challenge that we Jews face and the proper way of going about it. And he was always about showing and, and creating a love of Judaism, a love of being part of the Jewish people and, and embracing people through, through love and through positive elements of being part of this community rather than just saying, well, you have to do it because you need, we need more children. Like, no, <laughs> I, I want to have Jewish children. I, I, I want to have Jewish children because it's important for me that there be more Jewish children in this world. And it's not because anyone told me that, it's because I have learned why that's important. And so there's really positive ways to go about it and there's very negative ways that it's being done. And the negative ways usually don't work. So, very deep conversation. But I really implore you to read about my daughter. He's written a lot of books. He comes from a British perspective. Um, and I think he would open up your eyes to a lot of what we face <coughs> internally as a community and what we face historically um, to lead us to this. Yeah. If there's any question, I'd like to comment on um, Jewish continuity. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a person from the country where we're literally killing ourselves, um, yeah, I mean, not physically, but both um, you know, not having children.
always been a factor of work. Um, our population sizes have always been at a, at a very critical point in terms of continuity. And yet we've managed to ride it out. So it's always been at the forefront of our minds. Um, and Israel is a big part of that. I mean, just to circle back and I can really kind of wrap up with this is, again, for me, Zionism is about Jewish survival in this world. And there's the element of what we need to do internally as a Jewish community to try to preserve the Jewish community from, from like you said, killing ourselves spiritually or unfortunately caving to anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism isn't always just people killing us, right? The Nazi anti-Semitism was killing Jews. Just over the border in Russia, in Soviet Union, they didn't kill Jews. They just told Jews they couldn't be Jewish. And after a couple of generations of being told you can't go to synagogue, you can't circumcise your children. Slowly, you can't talk about your traditions. Slowly, they will be lost. And that's something, one thing we have to deal with. But then when somebody does try to just kill us, and with all due respect, I don't believe that that's not gonna, that somebody won't try to do that again. And the only thing that will make them not do it again is the fact that we have a Jewish state that will be there to protect us. To do whatever the equivalent is of bombing the train tracks, which, this country could have done, America could have done, and most of Hungarian Jewry would have been saved at a critical point in that war, and they chose not to. The 600 plus passengers aboard the St. Louis who sailed to the coast of the United States and were told, no, go somewhere else, and then sailed to Canada and were told, no, go somewhere else, sailed back to Europe, many of them died in the gas chamber. I live in a world now where that will never happen again. Because there will always be a country with an army that will bomb the train tracks, that will take in boatloads of Jews. And everyone who's not Jewish has to understand that whether Jews know it or not, we live with a sense of security in this world because we have a Jewish state in this world. So I will always be a Zionist. That doesn't mean that I will always defend Israeli actions or Israeli policies or Israeli government officials. Because sometimes we have to speak out. But I will always, always defend Israel's right to exist. I will always be a Zionist. Because I have a right to be safe in this world. And the world has not kept me safe. And that's fine. That's fine. I'm not a victim. I'm not. I always have been. I've never embraced it. And us actually creating this world was us doing just the opposite. It was not embracing victimhood. It was saying, it's fine. You don't want to. You don't want to protect us. We'll protect ourselves. And that's what Israel is. It's Jews standing up, saying we're going to protect ourselves in this world. And all we're asking for is for everybody to just be able to keep that. And you hold us to hold us to the flame. If we're doing something wrong, if we go too far, if we 